Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me here? OK. I'm really excited to be here to share my recent research. Um, over the past few months, I've been working on something that was inspired by my PhD research at Cornell. And I studied uh, fiber science and apparel design. Uh, so the title of my talk is From Natural Agitators to Sheep Women, Women Women's Representation in Digital Archives. And I was brought to this research because I did a lot of uh, digital historical research focused on uh, 1830 to 1850, uh, looking at the archives um, that were written for the sheep and wool industry, uh, specifically in New York. And I found that there was mostly perspectives uh, from men, and there was not really any visibility of women in um, in the sheep and the wool industry and their contributions to the local clothing and textile economy. So I'm for this talk, I'll focus on um, looking at the National Wool Grower and also the Ladies' Home Journal during the 1920s. To give a brief overview, I'll first give some background of what some more background of what brought me to this research. I'll talk about my main research methods, my main research questions, and some of the findings that I've come to in regards to the intersections of women's representation in the two archives. And I'll also talk about some of my conclusions. Uh, so when I was doing research in New York, I was looking for anything related to the sheep industry and anything about wool. And by chance, I came across a book about uh, Susan B. Anthony and the early years. Uh, so she originally was in Vermont, and her father was called to move to a border town um, in Battenville in New York, uh, specifically to help revitalize a cotton mill that was struggling. And this is a map that shows the, the layout of the town. Uh, so the number six shows where her family lived, and the number 12 shows where the cotton mill was. And even though her father um, moved there specifically to help revive the cotton mill, uh, unfortunately, it, the, they had to declare bankruptcy by 1846. And shortly after that, uh, her family moved to Rochester. And it was there that Susan B. Anthony was able to become a leader in the women's rights movement, and where she initially began to, um, began to uh, try to get the right for women to vote. And some more background. Um, so in 1840, the sheep and wool industry was heavily concentrated in the Northeast. But by 1920, we see that it shifted uh, to the West Coast and the Midwestern states. And so, um, so I'll be giving this presentation with this context in mind. And for this research, I looked at the National Wool Grower uh, because it was a primary publication that was available uh, at the time. And it was a publication that was meant to be read by people who were in the sheep and wool industry. A lot of the articles were written by sheep farmers, but also other prominent people in the wool industry. And the Ladies' Home Journal was a prominent publication for women. And this provided a more, more context for the time period, especially how women were being targeted as consu primary consumers of wool. And I focused on 1919 to 1924. And th these are the time periods where I was able to find open digital resources. Um, where the archives were available by these different organizations. And I use a comparative historical approach. And I have two primary research questions. The first is, how were women represented as producers and consumers in the National Wool Grower and the Ladies' Home Journal? The second one is, what social, cultural, and political factors influenced women's representation? And so this is the first article that I found in the National Wool Grower in relation to my topic. Uh, so the title of the article was Natural Agitators. And uh, the author, he, he describes um, how the women's right to vote was um, starting to develop. And uh, he explains, now the great issue is women's suffrage if one listens to one of these women agitators. And then he goes on and he explains, women's suffrage will come and in five years, uh, not 20% of the women of the country will take sufficient interest in it to vote. So um, women's right to vote was expected to be a policy that was approved, but uh, from his perspective, he didn't think that 20% uh, of women would be using their new right. Uh, and in the same year, the, the leaders of the sheep and wool industry were also starting to uh, increase the visibility of women and recognize them as leaders in the industry. Uh, so this was a an article that was called Texas Sheep Men's Annual Meeting, and it highlighted uh, a woman who, uh, sh she had her own sheep business and was uh, successful in it. So the author explained, Ms. Donna Gardner of Texas, um, she's ex extensively interested in sheep with her sister. And then it further explains, she personally supervises all 
the ranch work and experiences no difficulty in obtaining and keeping the herders. And a lot of the workforce on the sheep farms was actually uh, people who were coming from Mexico to work on the farms. And she, and the author further explains, these women secured from 48 to 57 cents for their wool a year ago, while the great bulk of panhandle wools brought only from 35 to 40 cents per pound. And so, um, the, these women were able to uh, get a higher market price for their wool compared to the average prices at the time. And then uh, it says these women have made a huge success in the sheep business. So uh, they're starting to become um, regarded as leaders in the sheep and wool industry. And this is one of the first articles that I found that was actually written by a woman in the National Wool Grower. And the title of the article was Lambs, Wool, and Women. Uh, and Laura Helton of Colorado, she explained, I received a letter from the National Wool Grower advising that women were to have a place in the magazine in which to relate their experience in the sheep business. And she further explains, first I must tell of my greatest experience since I have been interested in sheep, that of having the help of a business partner. This partner has proven truly wonderful. He takes such an interest in the work. But then further on in her article, she, ex she explains that it's not actually a male person. Uh, that is her business partner, it's actually her Ford truck. Um, so, is <laughs> so showing that, um, you know, she, she has her sheep farm and uh, she's managing it and she doesn't necessarily rely on a, a male partner. It's actually, she's actually adopting the latest technologies that are uh, newly available during the 1920s. And I also, I, I actually didn't find that many uh, representations of women in the, in the National Wool Grower, which is why I started to also look at the Ladies' Home Journal. And this provided a lot of examples of how, how women were expected to be uh, consumers of wool and support the wool industry. And I found three major examples of that. So women were expected to be consumers of yarn, wool yarn, to uh, knit or create different clothing products. They were also expected to be consumers of uh, wool fabrics. And they were also expected to be consumers of ready-made clothing that was available. And this is just an example of um, an article that was published um, just t talking about the characteristics of wool fibers and their characteristics uh, when they're washed. And then uh, the photograph there is an example of three designs made of wool. Uh, so throughout 1919 to 1921, I found several examples uh, that were trying to get women to be active members of the workforce. Uh, so after World War I, um, women weren't expected to just go home and uh, just go back home and not work. They were expected to be active contributors to the economy. So these were advertisements uh, where they were trying to get women to adopt the latest uh, knitting technology so that they can work from home. And in this case, it was to create socks uh, in a faster way instead of ha doing it by hand. And so, uh, here we can see that women were expected to be active contributors to the economy and also um, contribute to their own household income. And in the National Wool Grower, I also saw this. Uh, so this is a photograph um, from the, the Ladies' Home Journal that shows women going to the employment office. And I also found an article in the National Wool Grower uh, where it highlights that women were working in uh, a company that was considered one of the major manufacturers of clothing at the time. Uh, Hickey Freeman was based in Rochester. And in this article, the author states the average wage in one of the Hickey Freeman coat shops, where both women, men, and, men and women are employed in equal numbers, was 12.25 a week in December 1914. During the same week in December 1919, it averaged 31.50. Uh, so in this article, it further talked about how the wages actually increased for um, the workforce before the war and after the war, and how women were um, part of that uh, labor workforce. And in the Ladies' Home Journal, I also found articles uh, from a female business entrepreneurs. So um, there was a woman who developed a company called Biltmore Handwoven Cloths that was based in North Carolina. And uh, she, in the article, she talks about the history of the of the company, uh, how she employed local people to create different fabrics, and she also included perspectives of her consumers. And this is just one example of a woman from Massachusetts, and she explained, I took these goods to a French tailorist who does the highest class work in the city, and she advised me that she believed it surpassed the handwoven goods in Scotland and England. Permit me to congratulate you on your methods of business and assure you that such service and such courtesy are, sh are sure to win. So um, it provided an opportunity for women to um, highlight their success as, as business women and also to 
um, to support each other. And this is an article from the National Wool Grower that further highlighted the importance of uh, women's labor during this time period. Um, so this, was, this article was about uh, a wool mill that was going to be developed in Denver, Colorado. And um, the author was talking about the potential labor that, and uh, employment that it can provide in the area. And they said, uh, wool mill labor is skilled labor and the work of a mill to a, considerable, to a very considerable degree is done by young women. And then the article further talks about how many um, people they expected to employ with the new mill. But it further highlights how women were, um, were a considerable part of the, of the wool industry during this time period. And in the Ladies Home Journal, there were several advertisements of what women could buy uh, that was made of wool. And a lot of the fashions of the time period during the 1920s was inspired by uh, French fashion. And, uh, they used a lot of different fabrics, so it wasn't just wool. Um, a lot of the fabrics that were discussed was uh, silk, georgette, and uh, this is just an example of one of the outfits that was made of wool. Uh, so long coats could be made out of wool. And during the time period, uh, there was also a discussion about uh, passing a truth in fabric bill. Something that was always considered um, important during the wool industry was that content was 100% new wool uh, rather than recycled wool. Uh, because this impacted how much money the farmers could make from the wool that they sold to manufacturers. And so the farmers, they were trying to highlight the importance of this truth and fabric bill uh, to support their, their small farms. And in the article, they explained, get the wool growers organization and the farmers organizations to unite with the Women's Federation and jointly demand that your state legislator enact a truth and fabric law before it adjourns. All the great reforms have come in this way, including women's suffrage. So with this, I see that between 1919 to 1921, there's, there's somewhat of a shift in the perception of, uh, of the role that women played in um, informing policy that could impact the sheep and wool industry. And based on the truth in fabric bill that was being proposed, I also found that the advertisements in the Ladies Home Journal, they started to show uh, language that emphasized uh, like the 100% wool aspect. Uh, by using the all wool standard um, language. And th these are examples of advertisements uh, for women's wool sweaters that use the language all wool in their advertising. And uh, this is an advertisement for ready-made clothing. And here I also found examples of how all wool, the word all wool was used to market the products. And the most expensive item on the, on, among these sheets was an, an outfit here highlighted that was made of both wool and silk, and it was about $49.95 at the time, and in today's money, that's close to $600. Um, so even though this ready-made clothes was heavily advertised in, in these magazines, it wasn't something that all women could necessarily buy. So it was more common for, for women to um, buy clothing patterns that they can sew so that they could uh, create different clothing products that were in line with the fashion trends. So in the National Wool Grow and also the Ladies Home Journal, there's a lot of references to women's sportswear, but it's not the sportswear that we think of today. It was more of a relaxed look where women could feel more comfortable in their clothing. And this just highlights one of the, one of the wool outfits that uh, someone could, could create by, and use wool fabric with. And women were also uh, being introduced to different techniques if they couldn't purchase all wool fabric. Uh, so the new wool embroidery fashion trend, and it was something that was uh, considered to have global inspiration from Eastern Europe. And by 1923, I saw that there was examples of clothing that was specifically targeted towards business women. Uh, women were seen as active contributors to the economy at this time. And then there was also starting to be uh, advertisements for women in business to buy cars. And um, in terms of the political aspects, um, by 1924, women actually were able to vote on uh, a law that could impact the sheep and wool industry. And here we see the representation of women in Republican parties, Democratic, and independent parties. And just to give an idea of the, how big the wool industry was at the time, uh, each month in 1922, uh, the wool industry, they sold millions of pounds of wool to the mills. And in total, in 1922, they sold over 650 million pounds of wool to manufacturers. And in 
And to conclude, I found that there were limited representations of women in the National Wool Grower magazine, um, but I did find some examples of uh, women's entrepreneurship and their leadership in the industry. I also found an example of uh, their, uh, their uh, voting participation in a bill that impacted the, the industry. And I also found examples of how they're presented as active producers and consumers of wool for yarns, fabrics, and ready-made clothing. And in terms of the social, cultural, and political factors that influenced women's representation, I found examples of women's labor in farms, factories, and households, especially as they were part of um, the different businesses. I also saw examples of how they were uh, depicted as potential consumers um, that, because of the Truth in Fabric bill. And uh, there, I also, okay, time's up. Uh, just, for further research, I'm hoping to further analyze digital archives. Uh, these are archives that I focused on because they were um, open source. In the future, I'm also hoping to do sentiment analysis and to potentially further expand the study to include the 1930s, since um, the 1920s and 1930s were two um, time periods that had different economic aspects to them. Thank you.